Hey everyone, I'm Rather Incoherent, and today I'll be talking about the Scarlet Keys campaign, and more specifically how I think you should route through the map. If you care about spoilers, then you're going to have to go for this one, because unfortunately, your first time through the campaign, you don't know what happens when you go to Stockholm. There's nothing on 36 feet to read ahead of time. When you go to Marrakesh, there's a little blurb you're allowed to read. It doesn't actually tell you what's going to happen in Marrakesh, it's just flavor text. In your first playthrough, you go to a place and something happens to you, and to give you advice is to spoil you. So I'm not going to try to do a spoiler-free version of this conversation. I'm going to get right into the spoilers. If you care about that thing, now is time to leave. So getting into routing, there are two things that are immediately obvious. The first is that you literally can't do everything. As far as I can tell, you're like two times short of being able to do all 10 scenarios. But even if you did all 10 scenarios, you wouldn't be going to Nairobi to get the Bale Engine. You wouldn't be going to Mana Quarry and doing that quest line to get the Runish Chime. You wouldn't be stopping at Ybor City six days after Havana to get the Mirroring Blade. You can't do everything in the campaign. There simply isn't enough time. So seeing as you can't ever do all the scenarios and get all the stuff, you should be planning to skip some things. And that's actually a good thing because there are 10 scenarios here. There's going to be one of them that you don't like and you don't have to play that one anymore. I'm going to spoil it for you. It's Shades of Suffering. We can skip that one. Because Shades of Suffering requires you to go do a bunch of routing hoops, either burning three days in Shanghai or coming to Hong Kong six days after Shanghai, both of which are awkward. And then you get to play the hardest scenario in the set that's also hard in a very unfun way. And it's just much easier to do literally anything else. And speaking of things you shouldn't be doing, you probably shouldn't go to Lagos or Tokyo. You might pass through Lagos just routing somewhere else, but the smuggling intelligence quest line isn't very good. Reducing a token by one doesn't do anything. If you don't know, going from Lagos to Tokyo, you smuggle intelligence, you have a weakness for a while. When you get to the second one, you remove it, you take a token in the bag, and you replace it with one higher. So you turn minus four into a minus three. If you were testing and beating minus four already, which you very well may have been because the bag in this campaign is brutal, then that doesn't do anything. You beat both of them. If you were testing only at plus two, you still lose to both of them, so it doesn't do anything. You have to test at specifically the number that you increase it to, and then one in however big the token bag is, so like 22 or so. That many times it'll actually matter. The effect of smuggling intelligence is incredibly small. It's not worth the time. Don't do it. So these are the only things I think are obviously super not worth it. Places like San Juan, Quito, Reykjavik, and Kabul, these are all places where they're probably going to be something you're forced to go into just because they're in the way. Like, you literally can't go from North America to South America without going through them, but they're basically dead jumps. As far as I'm concerned, when you look at the point in time where you get stolen from and where these places are on the map, and the fact that you're not even statistically likely to get it without hitting three of them, as far as I'm concerned, you get stolen from, and that happens to you. You're just going to randomly lose some keys halfway through the campaign. There's nothing you can do about it, and there's no real point trying to route through and get all of them. So I also consider these locations dead jumps. So the main thing that routing is going to be is trying to figure out how to get around to all the things that are left that you want to do while giving up as little as possible, because you still can't do everything. This does still include nine scenarios, the Nairobi quest line, the Manaquari quest line, strange architecture at Bombay and Stockholm, coming back to War City, you still can't do everything that's left. There's not a route that's going to hit everything. So it's about what you're willing to give up, what you think is going to make the most fun campaign. Because of all that, I don't think there's ever really going to be an optimal route. Because for me personally, if someone told me they had an optimal route and they didn't go to Constantinople, I would tell them they were wrong because Constantinople is my favorite scenario in the set. So optimal stops applying. If we're not going to Constantinople, we made the campaign worse. And likewise, there's going to be at least one person in the world who saw this and they're like, huh, so your route's trash because you aren't going to Shades of Suffering. And while I don't understand where that person is coming from, they're right. If they love that scenario, they shouldn't be following my route. So for me, the big thing that I want to do when I think about optimally routing this is I want to do Bermuda. I want to do this because the most likely thing to end your campaign in the game to me Seems like it's the beginning of Congress of the Keys, where you spawn with elite enemies engaged with you. I think that is the single most likely point in the game to result in your party failing to complete the campaign, and avoiding that by going to Bermuda, getting the true ending, and not having Desi, Aliki, or Thorn be eerily silent means that no one spawns engaged with you, and you start with like seven story assets. To do that, you'll need to go to Bermuda. You'll need to make sure that neither Aliki or the Red Gloved Man die. You'll need to succeed and get R1. Then you can either go to Havana with the quid pro quo from Moscow to guarantee your success, or if you don't go to Havana, Desi just always lives. Same thing at Anchorage. If you go there and work with Thorn, he'll be fine. 
These three people, Thorn, Desi, and Alihi, only ever remain eerily silent if you kill them. You have to be directly involved to result in them getting replaced by a Mimic. So I think going to this to avoid that really hard spot at the start of the Congress of the Keys, even though it makes Congress of the Keys a lot less interesting and a lot less hard, is definitely the best thing to do for your chance of winning the campaign. So if we're going here, that means we also have to backtrack to London at some point, we have to go to Rome, and before we do all that, we have to go to Kathmandu and Sydney. What this does is after Kathmandu, you're allowed to go back to London. After you go to Sydney, you get a whistle. If you go back to London with the whistle, it unlocks a different thing in Rome, and when you go to Rome, that unlocks the Bermuda Triangle for Without a Trace. So all of this stuff that's in red is mandatory to me, and all of this stuff that's in black, we might have to go there, but we don't want to. So I've erased all that. I'm gonna talk about how the map works a little bit. Unfortunately, it's not entirely consistent. For all the map-based quest lines where you finish Strange Architecture or you finish getting a key somewhere, those are gonna cost you one time in the resolution. If you stop and you just begin a quest line, as far as I can tell, that never costs you a time. The resolutions for scenarios usually are pretty close to if you get an ally, it costs three times. If you get nothing, it costs one time, but that's not entirely true. Then when it comes to scenarios, it's not entirely consistent as to how long a scenario resolution is going to take. I personally know what resolutions I'm intending to pick on my next run, and most scenarios consistently have the same amount of time lost. But personally, I'm of the opinion that it's probably for the best if your scenario, or your route rather, has a little bit of wiggle room. Because that means that if you fail a scenario or get a different resolution, it's not going to time out and cause you to miss a scenario because you get there at 35 time instead of 34. So I'll cover how long these resolutions are with the intentions I have as I go through them. Let's start with this. We're in London. That cost you one time. And like a crazy person, we're going to Marrakesh immediately. That's one time to get to Marrakesh and then one time for the resolution. I believe the only way that Marrakesh ever takes more than one time is if you have the information from San Francisco and we obviously don't. And I should mention this now. I forgot to say it earlier when talking about general routing. Marrakesh gets harder the longer the campaign goes. The big breakpoints are day 15 and 25. Day 15, you skip Act 1 and the boss starts on the map. Day 25, the scenario auto fails. And down here in Sydney, to get the key, it has to be before day 20. So those are things that can expire that we have to go worry about immediately. And that's why we're immediately crossing over to San Juan, coming down to Rio de Janeiro and then to Buenos Aires, where we're going to do Sanguine Shadows. And that's going to be 4, 5, 6, and then 7 time, because we won't be getting the optional ending to Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires has an optional final act slash agenda where if you do really, really well in the first scenario, then you can do it. But it seems like it requires a very good team with a decent bit of RNG to actually get to that secret finale. Then from Buenos Aires, we're going to follow this around to Sydney and through to Perth. Unfortunately, here we just have to backtrack. There's no way around it. We go up through Sydney again and to Manaquari. This is going to finish a quest line we've been doing. We started it in Rio, continued it in Perth, and that unlocks Manaquari to get the Runish Chine. We were at 7 before we left, so we're at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 now. And unfortunately, there's going to be another dead jump here. Right now, we have the dead jump going back through Sydney and the dead jump at Quito. But only two dead jumps so far isn't that bad. Here, we're making our third win going into Kuala Lumpur. Then we go up into Kathmandu. That allows us to go back to London later. We go to Bombay to start Strange Architecture, and we follow this around into Alexandria. That's going to be a three-time resolution, which puts us at 13, 14, 15, 16, and 19 time. After that, we go straight up to Constantinople, which is another three-time resolution, putting us at 23. From here, we're going to go up to Moscow to get an expedited ticket, over to Stockholm, which is going to finish the Strange Architecture quest, putting us at 26. There we go back to London. Please, don't do that. Stack up. I know you can. There we go. After London, we go to Rome at 28. And then, just because it's funny, we're going to expedite a ticket straight into the center of the Bermuda Triangle, because, as far as I can tell, location isn't a defined term, so if you're able to go there, you're able to expedite a ticket to it. This might technically be illegal, but also, if it is, I think that's silly. But we're going to just use that expedited ticket that we got from Moscow a second ago to fly from Rome. Straight here, it's skipping two additional time. That's about what I expect to get out of an expedited ticket. I don't think you can get much more than two times saved from one. And then at Bermuda, that's another three-time resolution. We're at 27, 28, 29, 32. When you leave through Bermuda, you're allowed to leave through any neighboring location, so we're going to leave through Bermuda, go up to Anchorage, and then at Anchorage, we're at 33 time. We start Anchorage, we'll run out of time in the resolution and get warped over to the finale. So this is the final route I'm planning on using. 
these scenarios I'm going to be seeing are Congress of the Keys, Without a Trace, Dogs of War, On the Nice, Not Dancing Mad, Dealings in the Dark, Segment Shadows, and Dead Heat. All right, now sort of then the order we're going to see them in is this. We're going to go through Riddles and Rain, Dead Heat, Sanguine Shadows, Dogs of War, Dealings in the Dark, Without a Trace, On the Nights, and then Congress of the Key. This route gets the standard eight scenarios. It gets the extra key over here and the extra experience up here. I feel like there's probably a way if I looked at this a lot longer and a lot harder to get another key, whether that's finding a way to route through Nairobi and Bermuda that allows you to get the Bale Engine or finding a way to do Havana and then come back for Ybor City later. But I've been looking at this long enough that I'm able to make this basically from a memory. And while it might be wrong a little bit, it's very, very close to accurate. And I'm pretty sure it's spot on. So I've already been looking at routing for way too long. This is what I'm going to be planning to do in my campaign. And the good thing about this route is if it turns out I'm wrong, I'm losing out on Anchorage, which is no great loss to me. We're still going to get without a trace. Anchorage is really just there to pick up experience at the end of it. So I'm not concerned at all about the possibility of maybe missing that if you get some bad resolutions. And before I end this video, I do want to briefly talk about the characters I'll be playing when I start doing this route tomorrow. So let's go over to ArkhamDB and look at my decks. Before I start talking about the decks, I want to mention previously I said I was playing Charlie and Lola. When I said that, I thought Charlie King was best as a fighter. But I've changed my mind, I was looking through other people's decks, and I came to the opinion that Charlie was best as a Kluver, which is also what Lola's best as. I don't think either of them are good fighters, I don't think either of them are great flexes, but I do think they're both at their best as a Kluver, and you can't play double Kluver, you just get overrun by monsters. Because I think they're both weak characters, I want to give them their best chance to shine, so I'm not going to run them together and run them on suboptimal builds so they can function as a team. Instead, I'm just going to be running Charlie Kane this campaign, and next campaign I'll run Lola. Charlie Kane, in my opinion, is not a good character. I look at what he does and I think, wow, so you're Calvin, but once you finish setting up, you have the good stat line. Whereas when Calvin finishes setting up, he has the good stat line and he's invincible. Because he doesn't really get any cool combos with assets from other characters, right? Because all of the cool combos you might think of with these ally assets tend to rely on exhausting them. So since you're exhausting them as Charlie, you're just getting stats for them. The one thing I've seen from Charlie that's compelling is the Summoned Hound Chance Encounter combo, where because you're summoning it from your graveyard, it's an additional cost to play Summoned Hound, but Chance Encounter does not play it. It puts it into play. Very different, legally sound, so we're going to use that combo a lot. And that combo is a lot better when you're investigating at 5, which is just how you want to investigate, as opposed to punching at 5 for 1 damage, which is not really how you want to fight. And then there's another combo that's very good for both Charlie and the Summoned Hound. You run Abigail Foreman with the Encyclopedia. This allows you to give yourself plus four to your book or any other stat until the end of your turn, or the end of the turn phase, I guess. But Ravenquill, if you upgrade it to have, I think it's called Unending Ink, the second ability, after you resolve an action ability on an attached asset, you may exhaust the Ravenquill to ruddy another asset you control, it's going to allow this combo to not just give me plus four, but ready one of the summoned hounds. And then you have Leo DeLuca for more actions after you've given yourself this bonus action. And the rest of this is just trying to help that out, right? Art student, because it's filling it out for calling in a favor, getting clues for my job, allowing Christopher to pay for things and give me book. Lab assistant, just as I felt like I needed more draw and more allies. All the draw that I can get. Why is deep knowledge not in this deck? That's probably a change I'll make. But yeah, I think this is a really compelling shell for a Kluver probably the best Charlie Kane can be. I'm still not convinced it's actually going to be very good. But if anything Charlie can do is going to be good, this is going to be it. And unfortunately, you aren't going to be happy if you run Lola as main fighter. So we've called in our good friend Zoe to fill the role. Zoe is a fantastic fighter. She got nerfed a good bit with the Cyclopean Hammer nerf because she was one of the best users of that weapon. But I still think she's a wonderful character. I don't know exactly what's getting cut here. I'm obviously not getting a 48 experience deck. I don't think anyway. But like you can just have Hollowed Mirror, Normal, and Relic Hunter gone and replace Zoe's Cross if you really need it towards the bottom of your deck. You can just not buy Enchant Weapon. That's a real easy cut. Like there's easy experience to trim from this. And the idea is just you run Cyclopean Hammer with an absolute shitload of draw because you have access to deep knowledge with your splash cards. You run things like Second Wind. Daring and Overpower, Upgraded Stand Togethers, Upgraded Emergency Cash under your stick to the plan, which is already fitting your deck, that sort of thing. And you're mostly using your additional experience. Just play out more assets, help afford the expensive Survival Knife Bandalopian... <laughs> Bandalopian Hammer, huh? 
Look, I'm still getting over a cold. My head's not entirely in it. But yeah, Cyclopean Hammer Survival Knife Bandolier is more money than you have. So Zoe helps with that. Faustian Bargain helps with that. It really is, as far as I can tell, the best way to make use of Zoe's additional income is to just have stuff you can keep spending your money on here. And in particular, Rite of Seeking is a great candidate. So that later in the scenario, when you've been fighting and you find some free time, you can throw down Rite of Seeking and contribute to the clue game with your now five, six head from Brother Xavier and the Bandolier combined with your base stats. And if it ends your turn, you're the fighter. You were using Rite of Seeking, that's fine. That's not even a downside. So I mean, yeah, Zoe's a really, really strong character. If Charlie's falling behind, she might be able to help out a little bit. But mostly, I just wanted a solid fighter to pair up with Charlie so that Charlie had his chance to shine. Because if I put Charlie and Lola in the same group, I'd have to make one of them fight a lot more than they would want to in an ideal deck, and that would make them look worse than they are. And they don't need any help in that department. Anyway, that's it for now. I'll be starting this campaign tomorrow. See you then. If you liked the video, then like, comment, subscribe. You all know the YouTube algorithm drill. It does really help the channel grow, and I do greatly appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one.